magnetize your minis, flight stands, custom kits, and all the hobby supplies you'll need from the magnetbaron.com. <laughs> Hello and welcome to the YouTube channel for CraftWorldEldar.com. I'm Brent, and in this video, I'm going to be reviewing the 10th edition Eldari Forge World data cards. For those of you who don't know what Forge World is, Forge World is a subsidiary of Games Workshop that produces additional models and rules for the game. And every faction, well, almost every faction has Forge World options. In some cases, these options expand the index or the codex and more traditional 40K play by a fair amount. Uh, some factions only have a couple of Forge World options. Craft World Eldar have 10, or 12, excuse me, 12. So if you're looking for these, if you go to the Warhammer community page in the news section, you can scroll down and find the Imperial Armor Supplement, which has rules for all the Forge World units. And if you want to buy these things, you don't do it on the GW page. You go to the Forge World page, you can Google it, and you can order these models. Incidentally, if there's anyone from GW listening uh, or Warhammer community, I, I have a request. There should obviously be a page, a landing page with the Munitorium Field Manual, the core rules, and the link to the indexes for every faction, as well as a link to the Forge World options. It's just crazy that that isn't there and that we have to scroll back through news. The uh, Explorer Games Warhammer 40,000 link seems like it should be the place to go, but when you go there, you just get spammed with spammed with banner ads for the Leviathan box set. So if you could keep your like marketing people in their lane and put all the rules in one place, because so many leaps and bounds have been made with making the game more accessible. It's just weird that the rules are spread out like that. This is this is a loving suggestion. I love you, GW. I'm not mad. I'm just confused as to why this is the case. Okay, Forge World units. So as I said, we have we have 12 additional data sheets in addition to what is in the index. And the first thing I will say about these is that they look to me to have been designed by someone other than the person who designed the ones for the index because the overall power level is just different. Uh, And I think generally a bit more in line with a lot of the stuff available to other factions. There's some really great stuff here. It's hard for anything to stand out with the exception of maybe one data card compared to the stuff that's in the the index. There are several units here that are viable for competitive play. There's one that I think is like very viable. And there's uh, there's a few things that you're going to run only probably in casual games, and that's fine too. Uh, Forge World has always catered to people interested in expanding their collection, both in ways that increase the availability of competitive models, but also just like cool fun stuff like Phantom Titans that you're not you're not gonna you're not gonna run in a in a tournament because you can't. We'll get to that. Uh when I say can't, it's because of points. These these models are totally legal everywhere normal models are legal. Okay, let's dive in. The Wraith Seer. So the Wraith Seer, for those of you who don't know, is uh, in the lore a a more elite and psychic version of the Wraith Lord. These are the most powerful of the the Wraith Warriors that go out and do the stuff. I'm I'm accepting Wraith Knights here because Wraith Knights include one living being and one dead being, and they are usually twins. Um, But in terms of just like the straight up ghost uh, constructs, like the Wraith Seer is the theoretically the creme de la creme of uh ghost heroes and in previous editions the wraith seer has always been obviously more souped up than a wraith lord uh and that is no longer true which is interesting they're both 160 points but the wraith seer is just kind of like an alternative build instead of a better build uh historically the wraith seer has been different from the wraith lord and it has psychic powers it has an invulnerable save and although it can only take one shoulder-mounted heavy weapon, in addition to the traditional options, it can also select a D cannon, which is has always been a good pick. Sometimes people would choose a Bright Lance to save points, but now, of course, you get any weapon for the same points, and you might be thinking, so of course I'll take the D cannon. Brent, what do you mean? It's a the D cannon's amazing, but dear listener, for the first time in history, the Wraith Seer D cannon is a different weapon than the D cannon on the platforms, and it is objectively nowhere near as good. It's still good, but it's objectively nowhere near as good. So let's take a look at the data card. 
The Wraith Seer is move 8, toughness 11, 2 up save, 5 up invuln, 10 wounds, 6 leadership, 3 objective control. 3 objective control is nice. Has access to all the same heavy weapons in a 1 up version of the weapon, plus the Wraith Seer D cannon, which is a 24 inch range like the regular D cannon, but only 1 attack instead of D3 attacks, hitting on 4s. Strength 14, okay, okay, looking pretty good. Minus 4 AP, still looking pretty good, but then D6 damage, no indirect fire. Uh, I say again, no indirect fire. Now, because it has minus 4 AP and devastating wounds, it's still probably a slightly better pick than the Bright Lance, especially just because of where this thing wants to play on the table. Uh, the Bright Lance, of course, has a 36 inch range instead of a 12 inch range, and it does D6 plus 2 damage instead of D6, but it doesn't have devastating wounds. And it's minus 3 AP instead of minus 4 and strength 12 instead of strength 14. Uh, so you can use a fate die to make the Wraith Seer D cannon automatically do D6 mortals instead of D6 plus 2 regular damage. And then you could use another one to just make it do flat 6 mortals. And the fact that it hits on a 4 up is not as bad as it initially sounds because you get a free reroll to hit and a free reroll to wound because of the detachment rules, which means that the math is slightly better than if this thing hit on a three up. It's like if it hit on a, I don't know, two and a half up or something. So you don't have to pine over the four up ballistic skill because of that reroll. It still can miss, but the math is fine. But a single attack uh, on a D6 damage weapon is not, even with devastating wounds, is not super impressive compared to the other stuff you can get in the codex for less than 160 points. In addition, though, the Wraith Seer has access to Destructor, a psychic power that has a 12 inch range. So you see how this is uh, shaping up. This The Wraith Seer wants to be up close and personal. Uh, the Destructor has Torrent, so it auto hits, D6 attacks, strength 5, minus 1 AP, 1 damage. So it's a good, it's a good anti infantry. Uh, clear out some chaff attack. Not, nothing too crazy though, but it has the ability horrify in your shooting phase. After this model has shot, select one enemy unit hit by one or more of those attacks. That enemy unit must take a battle shock test. Now, because this is happening in your shooting phase, as I mentioned in a previous video, your opponent may not use insane bravery. Uh, however, that unit will also recover in your opponent's command phase, but this prevents your, this prevents your opponent from using stratagems if they fail the battle shock. Battle shock's really good. So horrify is good. This is like probably the one of the more important edges that the wraith seer has when compared to the edge the wraith lord. Although I do think the wraith lord is probably a slightly slightly stronger include. Uh, on the melee front, the wraith seer has a similar melee profile to the wraith lord, but it's more geared towards killing infantry, heavy infantry, and characters. Whereas the wraith lord is good at that, but is also good at killing monsters and vehicles. So the Ghost Spear has a strike and a sweep profile. Uh, both of these have anti-infantry too, which kind of makes sense. I guess they're thinking of this as like the grown-up version of the Witchblade that Warlocks carry around. Uh, so even though it's got high strength at strength 10 and strength 7, most infantry it would have been wounding on um, twos anyway, but now it will always wound on twos with anti-infantry. Uh, the strike attack is four attacks, Strength 10 minus 2 flat 3, but it has precision, so it can target characters. Theoretically, the Wraith Seer is like a, a character counter, um, a counter to enemy characters. And then the sweep attack is 12 attacks, hitting on 4s again. And the when you have 1 attack and you're rerolling and it hits pretty hard on that reroll, that math is pretty good. But on 12 attacks, hitting on 4s kind of sucks. Um, uh, Strength seven, minus one, flat one. So good at killing infantry. Uh, the Wraith Seer is good enough that in like pseudo competitive games, you can bring a couple, use your models, feel good about it. It does some interesting things. It's pretty good. But I don't think that with the other stuff that we currently have access to, there's there's any reason that you would consider taking this to a tournament if you were trying to do well, except that the model looks awesome. And maybe, well, what, what does well mean? What does well mean? You know, if you wanna, if you wanna win half your games, you could probably do that with the Wraith Seer. But it's not, it's not, it's not a top tier model. There's, there's no doubt. Okay. The Revenant Titan. Uh, 
The first thing to notice that its points are way down, it's 1100 points. So this is now theoretically a model that you, you really could bring to a competitive table. Uh, it is a, it is a more powerful Titan. So it has towering. We talked about towering in a previous video, which means everything can see it, but it can see everything as long as it has true line of sight. It ignores obscuring terrain. It has a move of 16. It has toughness 13. Ooh, very hard to wound. And if you threw uh, fortune on there. Just imagine how hard it would be to wound if it were minus one to wound. It's got a two up save and a four up in vuln. Woo, this thing's so tough. 30 wounds. Yeah, uh, that's pretty cool. And it has leadership six and objective control of 16. Wow, objective control of 16. So much objective control. Uh, it has access to a cloud burst missile launcher which is 36 inch range, 2d6 attacks, blast, uh, three up ballistic skill, strength eight, minus two flat two, so good heavy infantry elimination there. And then it can either take a revenant pulsar and a sonic lance, or it could take two pulsars or two sonic lances. Uh, the pulsar is a 60 inch range, six attacks, ballistic skill three, strength 14, uh, minus three AP, flat four damage. And then the sonic lance is anti-monster uh four up anti-vehicle four up so anti-hard target four up uh and it's only strength eight so that's going to matter assault and torrent auto hits d6 plus six attacks uh minus three ap flat two and in melee it just kicks things it's got its revenant feet so eight attacks three up weapon skill strength 10 minus one ap flat three damage uh it does the titanic adv advanced thing where it just steps over stuff uh, when, and it's got something called Towering Wraith Construct. Each time you target this model with a stratagem, you must spend twice that stratagem's stated CP to do so. It doesn't really matter because the only things... I, you'd be targeting it with Fortune, which is not a stratagem. It's a psychic power. And then Revenant Jetpack. Each time this model advances, do not make an advance for it. Instead, until the end of the phase, add eight inches to the movement characteristic of this model. Now, the thing with the Revenant Titan is... With 30 wounds and a two up, four up, and at toughness 13, which with fortune can be made just terrifying, it theoretically is a force to be reckoned with, but it doesn't compare favorably to the Wraith Knight, especially at 1100 points, because the Wraith Knight has weapons that do devastating wounds. So you can use a six on your fate dice and do 2d6 mortal wounds to a target. And this thing just doesn't do that. It, its attacks can still bounce off in vulnerable saves. Uh, there's no way to do mortal wounds. The Revenant Titan is good. It's scary at 1,100 points. It, more than half the models in your army, but if, you know, if you throw Fortune on there, it's going to be really difficult to deal with. But you could have three Wraith Knights for that, and you and you would want you would want three Wraith Knights the way things currently stand. Um, I don't I don't think you do want three Wraith Knights actually, but if you were gonna spend that, if you were gonna put those points into a Titan, that would currently be the way to go. But if you own a Revenant Titan and you're excited to be able to use it in 2000 point games now, you can totally use it in 2000 point games and it will do some work for you. Uh, okay, the Phantom Titan, the most famous Eldari Titan the Phantom Titan is still 2,100 points, so not legal for uh, competitive play because I think all competitive tournaments really are 2,000 points or less. Uh, I'm not going to say that much about it except to say that it, it's toughness 14 and it has 55 wounds. And for the most part, its weapons also do not have devastating wounds. But there is one. There's a D-Bombard with a 72 inch range that does D6 attacks at strength 20 that does 2D6 damage. And um, so that's that's crazy. Uh, if you're playing 3000 point games and you wanna get your Phantom Titan out or you know run a bunch of Titans and play a 5000 point game that's just Titans, then you should email me a picture of that because that's cool. Uh, I'll give you a shout out on my channel. Okay, the Cobra uh, is a super heavy tank at 415 points. Uh, the Cobra is really cool. It's got a huge base. It's hard to hide, uh, but it, it carries this really powerful weapon called a D Impaler, which uh, is blast and devastating wounds. Yikes. 36 inch range, D6 plus three damage, 
Uh, strength 16, minus 4 AP, flat 4 damage. Flat 4 is not as exciting as some of the other stuff. It does mean that if you do the Devastating Wounds, you don't have to, like, spend another die on the number of Devastating Wounds. It's just always 4. So if you auto-wounded a couple of times, that would be pretty brutal. And then it's got this ability in your shooting phase, after selecting a target for this model's DM pillar, roll a D6 for every for the target unit and every other unit within three inches. And on a five up, that unit at the end of the phase is takes D3 mortal wounds. It's like this area effect distortion of reality. Uh, D, D weapons suck stuff into the warp, which is just really cool narrative wise. Uh, so strength 16 minus 4 AP flat 4 plus a, ch a chance... Uh, one in three chance of taking another D3 mortal wounds is pretty good with that rate of fire of D6 plus three with blast, no less. It that is a that is a scary loadout, and this thing is pretty durable. Also, it's got 24 wounds. It moves 14 inches. It has a two up save and a five up invulnerable save. Love the five up invulnerable save. There is no doubt that this thing is objectively good. I think at 415 points, it is appropriately pointed. Uh, and as good as it is, I'm not sure it is as good as three fire prisms plus a war walker or like a Eldar Wraith Knight plus a... Uh, I don't know what's what's cheap these days, like a troop master or something. The Cobra's really good. Uh, it's just it's not quite as aggressively pointed as some of the stuff in the main index. But if if there is some sort of balanced data sheet that changes things, we might find ourselves taking a really close look at that model. I will say if you've never used super heavy tanks before, you might be underestimating just how hard it is to keep them out of line of sight. Uh, you can throw them into reserves, of course, but but that that is an issue if your opponent. Uh, you're going to struggle to hide it first turn. Uh, but in a game where the towering keyword currently exists and anybody who's running Titans can see everything anyway, maybe maybe it's not as big a concern, but it is a concern. Oh, uh, all the super heavy tanks, you can also give them like a, a default heavy weapon. They just get an extra one the way, you know, like wave serpents get a shark and cannon. You give them the bright lance, obviously. So it also has a bright lance in addition to the other thing. Okay, the Scorpion. Uh, the Scorpion is another super heavy tank, and it's very good. It's, I think, very similar in many respects uh, to the Cobra. It's 410 points. It's five point savings there. And it, too, it has the same stat line um, with the 24 wounds and the two up, five up save, toughness 11. Uh, it, it just, it has a different main weapon. So, the uh, the scorpion comes with a twin scorpion pulsar, which is a 60 inch range with a twin linked keyword. So you're rerolling one hit for your detachment ability, and then twin linked gives you rerolls for all of your wound rolls. Uh, six attacks, hits three up, strength 18, really good. So even like medium sized tanks, stuff like our Aldari tanks, you'd be wounding on twos with full rerolls, minus three AP, flat five damage is really good it's really good and then uh it has this ability lanced obliteration each time an attack made with this model's twin scorpion pulsar destroys an enemy model if that model has deadly demise the model's deadly demise inflicts mortal wounds on a four up instead of just a six that's really good you pick something in your opponent's backfield it affects the way your opponent deploys right because they, they're going to not want to put stuff near the stuff your scorpion can kill and then if stuff is clumped you're potentially doing a bunch of mortal wounds when you blow the thing up. That's that's a great ability. It's a great ability. Uh, like the Cobra, though, at 410 points, I think that the the Scorpion is not as good as a Wraith Knight because the Wraith Knight can push through tons of mortal wounds. And because the Wraith Knight has towering, 
your opponent can hide. It's hard for you to hide your scorpion and your cobra, but your opponent can hide stuff from them, but your opponent cannot really hide things because of the towering keyword from a wraith knight. And so currently these super heavy tanks are struggling a little bit with the comparison to a unit that is 40 to 50 points cheaper and can see just about everything. And although you can't really hide your wraith knight, it's pretty hard to, to hide these things also. But they're good. And again, I think if uh, if we see changes to if we see changes to the index, maybe this is a unit we'll seriously look at. And it's certainly good enough for uh, pseudo competitive games. I mean, it, it's that's a great ability. It's I think it's appropriately pointed for what it does, and it's very good. The Nightwing, uh, like the Crimson Hunter, the Nightwing is not good. It it is 150 points. Uh, it unlike the Crimson Hunter, though, I think I don't. I think the Crimson Hunter doesn't hover. Maybe just the uh, Hemlock Wraith Fighter doesn't hover. I, I don't know. I'm not running the aircraft. Uh, the Nightwing is not. It's not there. Um, it's 150 points, and it comes with some bright lances. Uh, it, it's good against stuff that flies. Uh, it has an invulnerable save. And aircraft don't have any objective control. They can help you score secondaries, which is good. But um, currently, it's just a... I think it's currently just kind of a tough addition for aircraft. Okay, the Warp Hunter. Now, the Warp Hunter is the first uh, data card that I think you could seriously consider in a competitive list as things stand now. It's, it's aggressively pointed at 130. The most obvious comparison, therefore, is going to be the Fire Prism. And... It's different from a fire prism. It has the standard chassis with the 12 wounds and the toughness nine and the 14 inch move, but it's it, it's main weapon instead of the prism cannon. You've got the the D flail. It has two different profiles and the devastating assault ability. So uh, the blast the, uh, the uh, blast profile yes has blast as a keyword. It's got a 24 inch range, D3 attacks, hits on threes, strength 12, minus four AP, flat three damage, devastating wounds. We know why Devastating Wounds is good. And then the Rift is also D3 attacks, uh, but it automatically hits with Torrent, Strength 12, minus 4, flat 3 damage. So basically what this thing does is auto hits within 12 inches and has Blast outside of 12 inches. Uh, and then it has, in your shooting phase, after this model has shot, select one enemy unit, hit by one or more of those attacks, that enemy unit must take a Battle Shock test. Now... It objectively does significantly less damage than the Fire Prism. The, the Battle Shock test, at 130 points, having a unit that can throw Battle Shock tests on things and is reasonably durable, I think is very good. Again, currently, craft worlds are so good at just straight up killing things that maybe maybe we're not all that worried about inflicting Battle Shock and you could have a, you could have a Death Jester do it. Uh, but the Warp Hunter is competitively pointed. I don't think it compares favorably in that matchup to the Fire Prism, but I think that you could totally bring these to competitive tables, and depending on how you are thinking about Battle Shock tests as part of your overall battle plan, it could potentially do some work for you. Currently, if I'm choosing between them, and I, and I would be, um, I would pick the Prism, but I do think it's uh, I do think it's competitive. The Lynx. Uh, the Lynx is the other super heavy tank, and this one... This one is uh, pretty awesome for the simple reason that it's 155 points, and you get that you get you get this. It's not quite as tough as the the other ones, but it's got 16 wounds. It's got a five up invuln and a three up save. It's still toughness nine, like our standard chassis with the the move of four. But 16 wounds, five up invuln save is really good, and it's got speed of vol, so it auto advances uh, nine which is crazy. So it says that it moves 14, but you can move it 23 and still fire its Lynx Pulsar because the Lynx Pulsar is assault. And so that mobility is pretty crazy. Uh, 23 inches with this tank will give you a beat on most stuff on the board uh, early in the game. And the Lynx Pulsar is four attacks, hits on threes, strength 16, minus three AP, uh, and then D6 damage. So it's really good. Yeah, it doesn't do devastating wounds, but this thing is only 155 points. 
that's really good. Um, I think the, for me, the, the challenge to convincing myself to include a links is that I really like war walkers and I feel like, cause the war walker can make a scout move. It can, it can get into a similar place on turn one. It's less than a hundred points. And, uh, because it's minus one to wound natively, it, it's harder to wound than the lynx and it has a four up invuln save instead of a five up invuln save. And yeah, it doesn't have as many wounds, but it's like weirdly very durable. Uh, the lynx does have an objective control value of four. Um, but I do like the two, the, the twin bright lances, the, the lynx also gets a bright lance because it's a, one of these heavy tanks. So it's got a, it's got the lynx pulsar and the bright lance. And the, the War Walker's got a couple of Bright Lances. But the fact that you can use Fate Dice to push through eight damage on, on the Bright Lance on the cheaper War Walker kind of makes me lean in that direction. Although the Lynx is very good. And I at 155 points, again, if we didn't have so much amazing stuff in the Codex, I would say that that totally makes sense. It is competitively pointed. It's a good unit for competitive play. We just have stuff currently that is even more competitive. The Hornet, okay, the Hornet's really cool. The Hornet is this uh, one elf mini grav tank that is somewhere in between like a Viper jet bike and a War Walker in terms of what it does for you. Uh, it, it comes equipped with two Hornet pulse lasers. You can swap these out for two Bright Lances or any or twin other heavy weapons. And I am annoyed that the obvious thing that you should do is swap them out for two Bright Lances for the simple reason that I have three of th these things and mine are all modeled with Hornet Pulse Lasers. In play at your local club, the honestly, the Hornet Pulse Laser looks so much like the Bright Lance that I think it's fine It's to just say that they're Bright Lances and it's not weird or confusing for your opponent because they're almost indistinguishable. Uh, in a WYSIWYG tournament, you're not. WYSIWYG is what you see is what you get. For those of you who are listening, you're, you're technically not supposed to do it. But the Hornet Pulse Laser is like the Bright Lance 36 inch range and like the Bright Lance hits on threes, but it's strength nine instead of strength 12, minus two instead of minus three and D3 damage instead of D6 plus two. It gets an extra shot, but because of the free reroll to hit and the free reroll to wound, two shots with Bright Lances with one reroll to hit and one reroll to wound is just objectively way better than four shots with one reroll to hit and one reroll to wound on the Hornet Pulse Laser, even into something like Space Marines, you're you're maybe you're killing three instead of two, uh, but it's it's not it's not worth it's not worth the sacrifice. So you want the bright lenses. The chassis is a 14 inch move. It's a little bit like the Viper. Toughness seven, three up save, eight wounds, six leadership, two objective controls. So it's got more wounds than a Viper, but otherwise it's pretty similar chassis. And then it has lightning assault. Each time this model ends its normal move, you can select one enemy unit, excluding monsters and vehicles, that this move it, unit moved over and roll a D6. And for every four up, the enemy suffers a mortal wound. So you can drop some mortal wounds on stuff. Uh, this is really good. In, in my mind, so it's got better damage output than the viper for about the same number of points it's five five points uh our vipers are just a tool for stripping cover hornets are just damage dealers and at least in the early part of the game you're going to struggle to move over enemy units and, and be able to do the damage uh the war walker which is a bit more expensive has a, but not but not a lot has a similar weapons loadout with the twin bright lances it doesn't get around as fast. It doesn't have lightning assault, but it gets a scout move and it does have that crazy durability. So when you're deciding, if, if you're going to run one or more of these like small tradey utility units, uh, I think you, you just have to think about what you're you're using them for because they're, they're, they're all pretty similar to one another. Do you want the durability of the walker, uh, the slight extra killiness and speed of the hornet or the comparable speed and cover strippiness of the vipers i i think the i think the hornet is definitely currently viable um and i think it's probably worth paying five points to upgrade your viper as long as you don't need that cover stripping for for what you have in mind with other units okay shadow specters shadow specters are uh as they say banging and i think probably for my money 
currently the strongest uh, of the Forge World picks for the simple reason that they still have uh, our old battle focus ability, but it, you can deep strike them and still and still do it. So here, here's the here's the deal with Shadow Specters. Uh, first off, they only cost it's they, they only cost eighty points for the squad. It's just crazy. It's another twenty points for a Shadow Specter Exarch, which then takes the unit to six. There's no good reason to buy the Exarch, really. It just gives you an extra wound. The, the Exarch has the same weapons loadout. Uh, so I wouldn't. Um, every model is equipped with a Prism Rifle. And the Prism Rifle is... It's the standard Aspect Warrior stat line. and then But they've got a 12-inch move. And the Prism Rifle is two different profiles. There's the Dispersed Blast profile that's 18-inch range, D6 attacks, 3 up ballistic skill, 4 up strength, minus 1, 1. So it's a shuriken catapult uh, with D6 shots and blast. So good against anti-infantry, good against inf big infantry units. And then it has the focused profile, which is a 24-inch range, only 1 attack, uh, hitting on 3s, strength 6, minus 2, flat 3. You know, if you watch my videos, how much I love flat 3 damage. So good. Uh, stuff with 3 wounds often creates these inefficiencies. So flat 3 is great. It's great. And in addition to being able to deep strike for free and having stealth, so they're minus one to hit when you target them with shooting, uh, they get Shade of Twilight in your shooting phase after this unit has shot if it is not within engagement range. It may make a normal move of up to six inches. It can then not declare a charge. So these guys can move 12 inches. You could, you could deep strike them in, shoot something with them, and then battle focus six inches out of line of sight. That's great. And they fly. Uh... Or you could move them 12 inches into the middle of the table, shoot something, and then battle focus with them onto an objective. They have the five-up invulnerable save that Aspect Warriors have. And when you're doing the, the focus profile when it's five shots, you have a reroll to hit and a reroll to wound. And let me just say again, they're 80 points. They're 80 points, people. Uh, 80 points for a unit that can start the game in reserve, come in, shoot something with a pretty awesome shooting profile, and then disappear out of line of sight from your enemy at a 24-inch range, they're so good. Uh, I was using some Warp Spiders before, and now I'm probably going to use Shadow Spectres instead because they're 20 points cheaper, and I think better. These are just a great infantry pick. They're a great pick. Okay, the Scathak Wraith Knight. Uh, this thing is a little bit like the other Wraith Knight, but not as good. Uh... It's 385 points, so similarly pointed, and it has, an ad in addition to, uh, well, it has a different loadout. It has a different weapons load. It's the same chassis as the other Wraith Knight, the standard Wraith Knight, but it has different weapons, and it has this web webway shunt generator, which has a new and interesting ability. So it, it can take um, either Infernal Lances or the, the Death Shroud Cannon. The Infernal Lance is 24-inch range, four attacks, hitting on threes, strength 12, minus four AP, D6 damage, but Melta two, so D6 plus two with the Melta. But notice that it doesn't have uh, devastating wounds, so that's not a thing. Um, and then the Death Shroud Cannon has two different anti-infantry profiles. Uh, theoretically, when you when you take this thing, it comes standard with an Infernal Lance and a Scatter Shield, so it's got the, the four up invuln. But then you can swap out the uh, Infernal Lance for a Death Shroud Cannon, and you can also swap out the Shatter, the Scatter Shield for a Death Shroud Cannon. So you could just have two Death Shroud Cannons. If you did that, um, you'd have two weapons with the following profile. Uh, dispersed as Blast, Devastating Wounds, 3d6 attacks, hitting on threes, Strength 6, minus 1 AP, 1 damage. But 3d6 is a lot of shots, and if you fired both cannons... If you gave it two, it'd be 66, crazy anti-infantry. Uh, or the focused Death Route Shroud Cannon still has blast, even though it's focused. D6 shots, hitting on three is strength 10, minus three flat two. Really good against heavy infantry. If you were doing that with two of them, it would be 2D6 and you trigger blast twice. Uh, it's good, but its damage output simply can't really compare to the regular Wraith Knight with heavy Wraith Cannons that each do D3 shots and can just be auto-converted into mortal wounds because those will also kill infantry or they will 
blow another Titan or a tank off of the board. Uh, so I think it doesn't, it's very good, but it doesn't have, it, it doesn't quite compare to the regular Wraith Knight, really. It does have the, um, it has Deep Strike, which is great. Uh, and it has the Webway Shunt Generator once per battle at the end of your opponent's turn. If this model is not within engagement range of one or more enemy units, you can remove it from the bottle, battle, put it into strategic reserves, and then you would use Deep Strike to bring it back in. Now, you, you could, if you were trying to score something, dump it in your opponent's backfield. Uh, you could also, over the course of a couple of turns, walk a regular Wraith Knight into your opponent's backfield. Um, this is very good. I think it's just... I think it just doesn't doesn't quite... It's just similarly pointed to the regular Wraith Knight as things currently stand, but maybe currently not quite as good. Uh, okay, Aurelith. So... Erlith is the Shadow Spectre Phoenix Lord, and he does the thing that all Phoenix Lords do, where he makes the squad hit on twos, and that's cool. Uh, Illith's problem is that he's 105 points, and you could get just five more Shadow Spectres for another 80, and that's better. Uh, so he's got the standard Phoenix Lord profile, but he's got the 12-inch move because he's a Shadow Spectre. And then his ranged weapon, the Spear of Twilight, has three attacks, hitting on threes, strength eight, minus two, flat four. Flat four is cool. That's great. Uh, and then his melee weapon is the same thing, but it's four attacks, strength five, minus two AP, one damage. So not great in melee, but fine. Uh, and he has Shadow of Death while an enemy unit is within six inches of this model each time that unit takes a battle shock test, subtract one from the test. If you had an army built around Battleshock and you were going to get in there with Erlith, this would be good if you could resurrect him with something like the old Phoenix Gem power and or the old Phoenix Reborn power or if he could take the Phoenix Gem, which he can't. Um, but he's, he's too fragile to like get... I mean, six inches is right on top of your opponent's units. And if you're able to put Erlith within six inches of a thing and also mess it up to make it take a battle shock test. You can probably just destroy it. There's no reason that you, you would need that. Uh, if if you want, if you have him and you want to run him in, in like pseudo competitive, fun casual games with your Shadow Spectres, he's, he'd be solid enough, but he certainly doesn't compare uh, to the other stuff for, for competitive picks. So uh, for my money, the, the only data sheet from here that's really a contender the way things stand now for competitive play is the Shadow Spectres. I think that uh, the Hornet is absolutely worth thinking about, e even as things currently stand, as is the Lynx. If your play style is suited to it, maybe the Warp Hunter, but I still think the Fire Prism is, is winning out. Uh, if you like this stuff, if you have a bunch of Forge World models and you want to put them on the table, you totally can and against anything other than like really top tournament lists a lot of this stuff is going to perform very well for you you can have a lot of fun with it it's not like if you bring a, a cobra to a game your opponent's going to be like oh bring your big brothers list next time it's a great unit it's just some of the stuff in the codex right now is pretty insane or the index i keep saying codex I do think they could have given the Wraith Seer the D cannon, but may maybe just have it with the indirect fire, but maybe just have it have one shot. I, 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 I think maybe that would have been okay. Because with a ballistic skill of four, if he then is suffering from the fact that he's doing indirect fire, he'd only be hitting on five. He'd kind of have to use, he'd be dice hungry. I don't know. I think it would have been okay. In any event, those are our Imperial Armor Forge World options. And if nothing else, they add a lot of additional depth to our index that's worth remaining aware of as the meta shifts and as balanced data sheets come out there are certainly a lot of good tools in there all right that's what i've got if you liked this video i hope that you will click like if you've not yet subscribed i hope that you will subscribe if you wish to be helpful if you leave a comment that is helpful to my algorithm a quick shout out to those of you who have sent me emails if 10 days go by and I don't respond, write me again. I'm not blowing you off. I really am committed to responding to everybody. It's it's just gotten a little crazy with uh, the new index release.
And if you if you do want to get in touch, the, the other way to do it, if you become a patron, uh, you can join my Discord and there's prioritized personal correspondence and uh, the Discord community is so cool. You get early access to these videos. So I'll link that in the video description too. Uh, and, and maybe you'll think about doing that. I will be back in early July with another video. I'm not sure what it will be on yet. I'm waiting to see what GW does with reference to how people are reacting to new rules. So if they, if they make changes, the next video will be a response to those changes. And if they don't, it will be something else cool. Uh, back soon. Take care. Best of luck with your pointy ears. Bye.